going to take a look at one of my favorite passages in the Bible. It's in Daniel chapter 3, and it's the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, these guys were Israelites. They were followers of God, but they were living under Babylonian rule, under the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, this king thought quite highly of himself, like, and so he, he, he thought he was kind of better than any god and all that, and so he builds this gold statue in which he commands everyone to worship in, in his name. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they, they refuse. They're like, no, we worship God only. And so he threatens to have them thrown into a flaming furnace. That's where the first whopper was ever made, I believe. Um, <laughs> a flaming furnace to make them an example to all, to, to how supreme and powerful I, the king, am, you know. And so let's check out the response of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And, and uh, actually, this has been one of our memory verses this year in Nation's Kids Church. So I could read the Bible to you, or, or we could watch one of the memory verses. What do you think? You want to watch it? Yeah. yeah, you want to see what goes on in Kids Church? All right, let's play that. Daniel chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. Daniel chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. Daniel chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. Daniel, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from this mighty king. But even if he does not, we will worship God only. But even if he does not, we will worship God only. But even if he does not, we will worship God only. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from this mighty king. But even if he does not, we will worship God only. But even if he does not, we will worship God only. But even if he does not, we will worship God only. We will stand. There you go. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from his mighty hand. But even if he does not, we will worship God only. Amen. Some of you were kind of bopping and getting into it. I like that. A couple of you kind of giggled at the start, but by the end you're like, oh, this is awesome, all right? Hey, our kids love it. We got little four-year-olds that are running around their houses saying, I will worship God only, you know? So, so good. Amazing what God's doing in kids' ministry. It's also amazing what they put me through and, and get me to do and help them. This is heckling at the front row. What's going on? Look, I do love it. All right, I do. I do. <laughs> all right, what are we doing? We're preaching. All right, let's continue on from the next verse. I didn't wrap the whole thing. All right, verse 19. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and threw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, all very flammable items, uh, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Oh, that was his strongest men. Jeez. Uh, and then these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped, leaped, leapt. How do you say that? Is it leaped or leapt? But I thought leapt had a T in it. I don't know. It leaped to his, leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their head singed, their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. 
Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. What an incredible account. So much in that, right? How, how good is God, right? You know, in Kids Church, we called that series, We Will Stand, right? What were they standing? Well, these guys were standing on a conviction of the goodness of God to the point where they're thrown into their, their death, but God miraculously saves them from the fire. They don't even smell a smoke, and that leads this king to then praise the true God. Man, I look at these guys and their ability to say, no, we won't, we won't worship idols. We won't bow down to the pressure of our circumstance like their lives were at stake, yet they had this unwavering conviction of the character of God. Like, I know who my God is. Like, He is good. He is faithful. He is powerful, and He is able to save us. That, isn't that such a supreme level of trust in who God is and, and how good He is? But you know what? These guys' revelation goes even deeper than just things when things kind of go their way, but it goes beyond that. And this is evidenced by they say, you know, our God can save us, but even if he does not. Some of my most favorite words in the Bible, but even if he does not, nothing changes, right? It doesn't change anything. He's still the one that we worship. His goodness will prevail in some other way. You see, when you know his goodness, you carry hope. When you know his goodness, you carry hope. That's why David could say in Psalm 27, verse 13, I would have lost heart, Unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. In other words, I would have totally given up had I not known God for his goodness, for coming through for me. His goodness is the antidote to your hopelessness. His goodness is the antidote to your hopelessness. We, we can stand on the reality of his goodness to know that whatever we go through, right, we can place our hope in him and his goodness. Amen. That's why Christmas is meant to be a season of joy. It's because it's when Jesus came into the world, the hope for all humanity. His goodness is for you, though. It's not just, yeah, he's good and, and uh, you know, he's over there. No, his goodness is for you and for whatever you're going through. Romans 8.28 says, We know that in all things God works for the good of those whom he loves, those who have been called according to his purpose, right? Whatever is going on, find hope in the reality that he is good. You know, let me share this testimony. Maybe for you, you're feeling a little bit hopeless about the situation of your health. Let me read this. This is one of the praise reports that, you, that someone in our church sent in. Six years ago, my dad was in a cycling accident where he badly broke his hip and required a full hip replacement. It was later discovered that either in the surgery or the accident itself, one of the nerves was severed. This meant he lost 80 to 90% of the strength in his injured leg. His other leg could leg press 70 kilos, this one only 5 he spent the next six years struggling with pain and a lack of mobility in that leg and was no longer able to complete long and challenging bike rides like he used to enjoy. In July of 2022, on the Sunday night of Nations Conference, Pastor Tim Hall preached and invited people who needed healing to come forward. That night, my dad was miraculously healed and he gained back full strength in his leg again and was suddenly able to squat, run and jump all the things he couldn't do. Three months on... His leg is as strong as ever, or months on, his leg is as strong as ever, and today he completed a 360-kilometer cycle with a 1,500-meter elevation through the Pemberton region. Praise God for all he has done and all he is still doing. Amen? How good is that? Praise God. I would need four good legs to do a 360-kilometer cycle. No more no mobility aids, no more painful long car rides. He really is good. He is, isn't he? Yeah. Let me read another one. Maybe for you, you're, feeling, you're struggling with hope around your marriage or relationship. Well, check this out. Years ago, I was unfaithful to my wife, which caused my marriage to break down and we separated for some time. I was full of regret and guilt. And by the goodness of God, he led me on a journey of wholeness and eventually to restoration for my wife and I. Fast forward to now, my marriage has been fully restored and we have had another child since who loves God. He is so good to me. Yeah. Amen, hey? Amen. So good. You know, whatever has or, or hasn't happened this year for you, man, a revelation of His goodness is going to restore your hope. Amen? 
Do you know what else? When you know his goodness, you'll trust in him. Right? When you don't know someone, you don't trust them, right? When you think they're not good, then you won't trust them, right? But when you know he is good, well, that gives you a firm foundation to build that trust in him. In Proverbs 3, 5 to 7, Pastor Chrissy read it last week. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him. We can do that if we know he's good, right? And it says, and he will make your path straight. He makes it straight because he's good. You know, King David, he wrote Psalm 145. And it's the only psalm of them all that's titled as a praise of David. And he wrote it towards the end of his life as a summary right, of, of all that he'd learned during this long lifetime of following hard after the Lord. Now, before we read it, you got to understand, he has been rejected by his own family. He's been hunted by his own king. He's had to live in caves. He's been betrayed by his son. He's lost people close to him. And he's slipped up with having an affair with, with Bathsheba and, and so much more. And this is what he says. Uh, it's not going to come on the, on the screen. Sorry, you just have to listen. Verse 1 to 7, Psalm 145. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. Beautiful. You know, at the end of his life, everything he'd been through, he could have been cynical, he could have been bitter, he could have been worn out, burnt, whatever it may be, but no, he is so wrapped up in the goodness of God. You know, my prayer for me when, when I get towards the end of my life is not that I would be familiar with it all or bitter. You know, my prayer is that I wouldn't even be praising God like I am today. My prayer is that I would praise Him with an even greater further and a fervor and a deeper reality of knowing His goodness than ever before because I've continued to see the goodness of God. You know, David, he'd seen it all. He'd been through all kinds of crazy. And yet his trust was wholeheartedly found in the Lord because he knew it was good. The deeper our revelation of his goodness, the deeper we'll extend our trust and our dependence towards him. Now, if we come back to our text in Daniel, and, and it pays to understand the context. I mentioned that Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego were Israelites, and they were in Babylon. And King Nebuchadnezzar's strategy when he would conquer nations was, was not to just wipe out the next gen, but it was to actually indoctrin indoctrinate them in Babylonian ways. So they would become Babylonians. So then these nations would then go and fight for him as Babylonians. So they would eat, talk, live like Babylonians. And so these three had had their lives completely uprooted from Jewish culture and were no longer really in control of their lives. That sounds like it could be incredibly unsettling, right? But they didn't lose sight of who their God is, right? And we see in this scenario that their foundation was built on the reality of the goodness of God, which gave them the hope and the trust to go through the fire, literally. Whatever's going on in your life, whatever feels out of control or whatever hasn't panned out how you thought it would in 2022, put your whole trust in Him. He is good and His goodness is for you. Amen? Amen. Maybe you've been struggling to trust God with your kids or, or maybe it's with finance. Let this praise and report encourage you. We've been praying for extra funding for support for our child who has additional needs. This funding is hard to come by and there's been a lot of delays in dealing with government bodies and agencies. Today, we were notified that the funding has been approved at an amount even higher than what we have initially requested. Praise God. This is very much a miracle and so beyond our expectations. God is so good. He really is good, amen? Amen. Maybe you've been struggling to, to trust God and His goodness to bring a, a breakthrough in your mental health. Let this testimony encourage you. We had a young woman that was struggling with an anxiety. She responded to an altar call from, for prayer. She felt God starting to do something she was prayed for. But then she spent the week fasting and praying. The following weekend, God completely delivered her. Three months on, she says she feels like she is seeing life in color again. There's a weight off her shoulders, and she is so free. God is so good. 
Amen? Come on, we can praise God for that, yeah? <laughs> Knowing the goodness of God, it stirs our hope and it's the foundation for us to trust Him. You know, but that's not all. You know, we come back to the text and we can see the contrast in King Nebuchadnezzar from the start of the passage in verse 15, where he actually says, you know, what God can rescue you from my hand, right? He thinks he's, he's everything, the gods are nothing, all of that. Then we push over to that, to after this miracle happens, where we've, the, the goodness of God for those who love him has been fully on display, right? And check out what King Nebuchadnezzar's response is in verse 28. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Praise be to God. He couldn't help but praise. Two seconds ago, he thought he was the greatest, right? One thing was just seeing the goodness. He can't help but praise. Knowing his goodness makes you want to praise him. It, it stirs up a praise in us. You know, this praise report, Jesus came to me during prayer. After desperately praying of a situation that only Jesus could help me with, I finally found it in my heart to forgive someone. He came and filled me to overflowing. Oh, God, you floored me. I love you, Jesus. And it continues to go on to praise him. Look at King Nebuchadnezzar. Look at this praise report. A revelation of his goodness makes you want to praise. If your praise is feeling a little, your praise to God is feeling a little dry or, or dead or habitual or mindless, come back to the reality of his goodness, right? And let praise well up out of you, amen? We don't have to be awkward about if I'm going to clap or not when I read a praise report. Get excited about it. It's okay, right? Yes. Let me give you another one. Last water baptisms, the mother of a daughter who was baptized was so blessed by the whole experience. Her daughter had a life-defining encounter. Her whole family was present and felt touched by the Holy Spirit. And since then, she's come to me multiple times, smiling ear to ear and just so stoked by the goodness of God towards her family. She is beaming and praising God. He really is good. Amen? You know, it just makes me understand how David was undignified in his praise and his dancing when the Ark of the Covenant was being brought into Jerusalem, right? He was just overjoyed by the goodness of God. I'm not saying you all have to get half-dressed and dance around in here, but, but when we are so wrapped up in the goodness of God, we can't help but give Him glory. We can't help but sing to Him, but, but speak of Him, right? Yeah. Now, King Nebuchadnezzar, he's such a character, right? Right after he's had this moment of praise be to God, this is what he says in the next verse, verse 29. He says, Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other God can save in this way. Look, it's a little graphic. It's a little over the top, but his, his intentions are good. Right? His, his heart is in the right place. He just wants everyone to know about the goodness of this God, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He's like, I don't want anyone to say a bad word. You need to know he's good. Yes. And that's it. Experiencing his goodness makes you want to share him, yes. makes you want to talk about it. You know, it reminds me of the woman at the well who encounters Jesus. We, we know she's got some struggle when, when you, we, we hear that she's had five husbands and then living with another man now, but... She has this one encounter with Jesus by the well, and it changes everything. And she goes back and tells her town, and we read in, in John 4, verse 39, it says, Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I did. So when all the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. And now we've heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. Right? When you're aware of the goodness of God, it stirs you to share him. She could not hold back. She had to go and tell them. And that was the catalyst for them coming to Jesus. And then they said, wow, now we get it ourselves. We understand. He is the savior. He is good, right? We got to get wrapped up in his goodness again. Amen. In this Christmas season, we don't want people hearing how busy we are and how full. Let's share how great and good he is. Amen. Let me tell you another one. We've got two sisters in our youth ministry who are so on fire for God right now. But at the start of the year, they felt God tell them to start a prayer group in their school. They held back and they didn't do it. Then at conference, the guest preacher said, hey, there's, there's, there's someone here, there's people here whom God has asked to start a prayer group and you haven't. You've got to do it. So they started, just the two of them, praying in their school. Since then, 
They've run services in their school where students have fallen down under the power of God. Students have started speaking in tongues. Young people have been delivered, and students are getting saved. Now, as the prayer group grew, it was just this group of girls, so they started to pray for boys, that God would touch guys, and they would come in. They then saw seven guys get saved and attending prayer, and now suddenly they need to pray for more girls. (laughs) Now, instead of students being bored and resistant to chapel service, they can't wait until the next one. God is doing a revival work in their school. Come on, it's so good. He really is good, amen? Worship team, you can come join me. Let me give you another one. Year 11, rolled into youth with his friends without realizing what he was going to, that he was walking into a youth service. He was just coming to hang with his friends. Ooh, God's going to get him. <laughs> it says, God met him and he was fully touched. He has given his heart completely to God and is now at youth every week and bringing friends. How good is God? So good, right? When God does something, you can't help but share it. You can't help but bring it into other people's worlds. That's why it's so beautiful when new Christians come to faith, right? Because they're so in awe of the goodness of God and they can't wait to tell people and share it. My prayer is that the Holy Spirit would stir that in us again. The incredible goodness of our God, yeah? Yeah. You know, I've read some great testimonies and we've seen His goodness through the truth of His Word, but the pinnacle of His goodness is found in how He changed our lives forever by sending His Son, Jesus. You know, it says in Romans chapter 5, verse 6 to 8, you see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. That's you and me. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates His own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, whether God moves in our situations or not, the reality is His goodness is already on full display in what He's paid for us. He's paid for all our sin through Jesus, His Son. He's so good that He's completely cleared the way from us to Him. Through Christ, we can be reconciled to God. All our sin is paid for. There's nothing that separates us from our God who created us and loved us and called us to be in relationship with Him. He gave His Son so that we could believe in Him, so that we could have eternal life. How good is that? He really is good, amen? And maybe you're here today and this is the first time you're hearing about the goodness of God. You know, maybe you don't really know about Jesus or you don't have a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you used to in the past. I want to give you a chance to come and know Jesus, encounter His goodness, not just know about God. This isn't some religious thing we're talking about. I'm talking about the reality of God, His goodness moving in people's lives. And that's what He has for you. But more than that, more than just helping you in your situation, He wants to reconcile you back to your heavenly Father who loves you and created you. He wants to give you life eternal with God. Not separated from God, but every moment forever wrapped up in the goodness and the greatness of God. And so if you would would join me in just bowing your heads, closing your eyes, I want to give a bit of a private moment here just to every person here to to make a decision. If, If you don't know God, if you don't have this personal relationship with Him that I'm just describing, or maybe you used to, but you've walked away, and you just feel something, something's happening in your heart. That's God. He's calling you home. Now's an opportunity, a chance for you to come back to Him, to choose Him. And you need to know that He loves you. He knows you, the good, the bad, and the ugly. He knows everything. He knows what you're going through, what you've gone through, what's happened to you. And He says, you know what? I, I get it, and I love you, and I want to call you home where you've carried guilt or hopelessness, he's like, I want to deal with that. I want to wash that away. Where there's times where you felt lost or searching for something greater, something of meaning or purpose, he's like, I want to fill that void. And I'm not promising an easy life with Jesus, but I am promising that you'll encounter the goodness of God. And he loves you and he is for you and he's calling you home. And this is such, a, this is such an incredible moment, such a special and personal moment. And so if that's you today, 
you know you've got to make this decision. Maybe it's coming back or maybe it's for the first time. We want to welcome you into the family of God. And, and the Bible just says, if you believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that you'll be saved. You'll be saved from sin, saved from being separated from Him, saved from doing life on your own. That's how much Jesus loves you. He paid for it all so that you could come to Him. So if you want to accept Jesus in your heart, I want to ask you now to raise your hand. And together we're all going to pray. And so across this place, I'm just looking at, I want you to lift your hand and say, yeah, I want Jesus in my life. I want to follow Him. I want to know Him. I want to give Him my life. Raise your hand nice and high if that's you. You want to make that decision today. Just looking out across this place. Online, you can make that decision too. looking at this is the best decision you could possibly make a couple more moments I don't rush this because I understand it's a big moment decision online, I want to encourage you to go to nationschurch.com forward slash online and you can give us your details so we can pray with you and journey with you. But church, would you stand to your feet?